Okay, so this is your first time in the cave, Henrik Abramsen. So let's just start with you. Um, short introduction, you're an objectivist, you're concerned with the philosophy of Ayn Rand, yes. and you are a writer, You've been, you're working on a screenplay and also a theatre play at present. So maybe you could start, talk a little bit about yourself and then sort of segue into the Romantic Manifesto. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I was introduced to philosophy when I was about 15 or 16 years old, I think. Uh, I met a, uh, an objectivist teacher in my hometown who gave uh, a whole course on objectivism. And then um, uh, I took the course. And after that, I developed a uh, relationship with the teacher. And we uh, were, I was studying philosophy under him for a long time. I've been doing it for five years now, I think. Um, and uh, I've been both building my... Uh, my role as a philosopher under him and also as a artist under him. So um, uh, I've been doing uh, philosophy lectures and a little bit of that stuff, like explicit philosophy content for a little bit of uh, like one and a half year, I think now, mm. with Carl as well, mm. who was the moderator at a debate. And then uh, my uh, sort of main uh, passion and drive has always been uh, film and uh, movies and uh, stories and uh, so recently yes I've been working on uh, on a theater play and also a film script and uh, uh, the Romantic Manifesto or Ayn Rand in general was a uh, uh, was a crucial and uh, very uh, yes a crucial moment in my life where I read her and actually managed to uh, to finally express myself in the way that that was uh, that was the way I wanted to express myself because before reading Ayn Rand, I had tried writing and I had tried making film and stuff, but uh, I was I was pretty much of a I was pretty much a modernist in writing. I had no idea kind of what I wanted to write, and I knew these uh, these common bromides of you know if it's deep and I don't understand it, it's good. Yeah, right. And was, <laughs> if it, you don't understand it, it's good. Yes, it's deep. No, it's good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so I was being a confused uh, teenager. I was, uh, I guess, I was subscribing to that uh, thought as well. Mm. Um, and uh, w whenever I wrote, it was just meaningless pieces, like meaningless uh, stories and meaningless uh, dialogue for characters. And and the more meaningless I got, it the more uh, deep you got. The more deep I got. <laughs> and I remember showing it, uh, <laughs> showing I made. I filmed like a short film, it was like a psycho psychological short film in my room when, when I was a teenager and I showed it to a friend and he was like, yeah, huh, you know, I don't understand any of this, but it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, uh, but you're, you have basically no confidence when you're, you're making stuff like that because you don't know what you're doing. Um, but once I discovered Ayn Rand and started reading the Romantic Manifesto, it became clear to me what the actual purpose of artistic expression is, uh, what you're actually supposed to do, and uh, how you do it best. So instead of art being this uh, uh, this weird, uh, undefined concept of I just do whatever I feel like doing, now you actually have standards and you have guidelines to how you actually create good stories and how you create art and how you formulate your sense of life and stuff. and. Uh, it has helped me tremendously in absolutely every single way um, uh, to just from every single detail to the whole picture in itself is just it's easy and it's actually possible to understand and it uh, allows for it, it allows for actual writing and it allows for my confidence to actually uh, grow in writing. Mm. What do you think are the most important uh, points that you got from it like if you really start at the top what's What's the most uh, influential and, and, and also basic idea? I think the most fundamental idea that, uh, that, uh, that helped me to write was, um, was just the fact that uh, you're doing something in particular. It's, it's uh, uh, taking, the, taking the realm of writing down away from the modernists where you don't know what you're doing into saying, okay, here is what uh, writing is all about. It's about expressing your sense of life. It's about expressing your philosophy. And then uh, the better you are at expressing your sense of life, the better art it will be. 
uh, and that was sort of that is the fundamental thing, which is uh, which is still to this day helping me and and uh, guiding me on my way. It's um, mm. uh, it's the fact that I know uh, I'm not using it necessarily consciously, but it's just the fact that I know now and it's become part of my subconscious that uh, that I'm actually doing something very concrete here. Yeah, and then the and then there's like all sorts of lesser. Uh, fundamental things like she has an own book which is called uh, uh, the art of fiction a guide for writers and readers which is a book basically describing how you create plots and how you uh, how you integrate theme and characters and stuff into a, a story as a whole i was supposed to uh, bring it today actually but i found out that i have i had given it away just a couple of days ago, no so. <laughs> so so but but that's a good idea i mean we don't have to like strictly stick to romantic manifesto please uh, because i haven't read that book uh, i don't know if you've read it Carl. no oh, so i mean you're um, a wonderful guest to have i mean you, you are able to speak so that's yeah. uh, you can just continue and we can just sit there and listen yeah. to you. no seriously uh, just give us some ideas from from that book too if you if you may uh so uh that is based off of a uh, course that i think she actually held in her uh, in her own home in that the was bin spanger who collected because i read the art of non-fiction yes it has really good advice about uh, yes. writing in uh, middle uh, short Middle range articles, I think. Yes, she something like it. that. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. But okay. Uh, and this is, uh, I'm not completely sure where. Th I think that might be. Uh, I've read that one as too, uh, as well. But I'm not sure uh, if that was also from a lecture. But this was actually from a a, a lecture, and it was actually edited and um, and written by a Norwegian uh, man, Tore Bekman. Oh yes. yes. So he was attending the course, and then go Norway. Yeah, yeah go Norway. <laughs> And okay. he um, and he sort of uh, I guess listened to the recordings uh, afterwards and then sort of edited it down and put it into a book. Mm -hmm. And it's an excellent book. It describes so it focuses on literature and not on painting or sculpture or anything like it's just literature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and same as romantic manifesto. Yes, yes. Um, and it uh, it describes. It's been a while since I've read it now, but it it describes how you actually create a plot. Um, and what like the makes craft of actually doing it, the not craft just of feeling actually something. making the plot, yeah. yes, and then the different elements that you need in order to make a book or story work. Yeah. You need the conflict, and then you need the characters, and then you need the overarching theme, and it and it tells you very. I mean, she uh, she um, uh, describes like she demonstrates how you could uh, make a plot, and she takes uh, Notre Dame de Paris as a. Uh, as an example, so she says, "Okay, say you want to write a story. Let's just you you, you need to put it in the time. Let's say the medieval ages. Um, and who is a who could be a typical character in the medieval ages? Well, perhaps a priest, because there were many priests back then. Um, so what is it's just just going to be a story about a priest? No, there has to be some sort of conflict there. Mm. Say that this priest is in love, which is sort of in conflict with his religious uh, doctrine that." Living as a priest, you have to live in celibate and so on. So he has to be in love, um, uh, and it can't merely just be like uh, a sexual desire that he has for some random girl. But it has to be deep, both sexual and romantic, deep, deep love, which is affecting him. Mm. Um, and uh, well, can it should it be with anyone? Like if he is in love with a nun, it's not as dramatic. But if he's in love with someone who stands opposed to the church, for say a gypsy then it's much more dramatic. So she demonstrates how you can actually like cognitively just the process of you start from nothing and then yeah. you just something and then something more just to make it more and more and more dramatic. Right. It's, it's a brilliant exercise. Uh -huh. mm. That's perfect. So you can just uh, develop from those basic principles. You find your main character and then you just build. Yes. Build from, from there. there. Yeah. And that I think that extra science has been so helpful to me mm. uh, whenever I'm writing. Because mm. if I'm at a point where, I'm, uh, say, I'm starting to write something new, and I have this, uh, and I have this character and say, uh, well, the, the situation I have now is not too dramatic, so how could I make it worse for yeah. him? And then just by, just by asking these questions, uh, you, you, can, you arrive at... Just more and more drama. So mm. I, it was just, um, I think she, she says, like, do, do this. Ask yourself questions like, how, uh, how, could, like how could this be dramatic? 
you have this character and how could it be a serious conflict for him? And then why? You keep asking yourself why. Why is it so bad for him? And then you suddenly you just piece out a story inch by inch. There has to be a reason for it. You don't just invent something that is horrible, but right. there's a reason for it and it has to connect yes. with the other parts of the story as well. Yes, there's a reason for everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the less coincidence, the better. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's like, um, um, I think we mentioned once, we, uh, I mentioned to you once we met um, uh, Save the Cat, the book on screenwriting. Yes. And he, that's, he has a point where he says, okay, so the, the, the main character, let's say, is in a bad situation, but it's, he's sort of not outstanding in some way. So, okay, how do you do that? Well, you make the bad guy badder. Yeah. <laughs> So it becomes even more, you have to make it as, po as difficult for him as possible. Yes. So that he has to find a solution because uh, it's under pressure that that a character, a, a man or woman or anyone else yes. shows show their character. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and then she also says that um, in the in the best of books, during the, the novels and stories that actually uh, go to sort of the max drama, it has to, or I think she or Leonard Peikoff says it, there has to be at some point in time a conflict between life and death. Yeah, yeah. That um, yeah. you can have a conflict where, like in The Fountainhead, where Howard Rourke is struggling for his uh, identity, but at some point in a good story, uh, there should be some sort of struggle between... Um, between your life and your potential death, mm. just to take it to the extreme. And that is... Mm. Uh, that like is, a, a physical death. Yes, a physical death. Mm. Um, uh, or just it, its equivalent, mm. uh, which is also something I used in my own, uh, in my own writing. Will. So have you experienced that you've, you've been doing something, it doesn't work, and then you go to Ayn Rand or, or one of the ideas, and yes. then you actually manage to solve it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Many times. Uh, yeah. Uh, many, many times. If I was, um, uh, and it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's hard to really pinpoint like one specific instance because it's, uh, it's very often, but I, but when writing plots for the technical problems, I don't really go to the romantic manifesto because it's more overarching. I mean, it's yeah, more, yeah. more philosophical, yeah, whereas more the philosophical, other one is more practical, more general, yes. the, the art of, of fiction. Yeah. Yes. It's way more practical. So yeah. for instance, I, I was at a point in my, uh, in my play where I, um, uh, where I was, I was stuck, and I was like, "This is. I mean, I'm I'm getting to the climax, but it's not dramatic enough." <laughs> uh, uh, and so I thought, "Well, how how could I solve this?" And and I remember, well, uh, death is a very dramatic thing to to add to something. If you have the risk of death, it's like, well, hell, I'll just have the bad guy try and kill him. Yeah. Uh, so just adding something like that was was paramount right, to creating right. a climax. Yeah, because then. And you don't have to go into to the plot uh, before it's before you've written and finished. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, in a situation where that happens, if there is a conflict and it's not clear, but he actually tries to kill him after that, it's not. There's no more going back to saying, hey, let, hey, let's have a beer and talk this out. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's then you've really raised the stakes. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. if you, yeah. if your climax is simply uh, like a slap in the face, yeah. it's going to be very anticlimactic. It probably yeah. depends on, on the certain movie. And some, I will never talk to you again. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and and that that could that could be dramatic in uh, some, but that will be entirely different circumstances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so you can also relate it. I mean, it doesn't have to be like full-scale physical drama all the time. But it can be relative to the rest of the story. How what what a peak is? Yes. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Absolutely. I <clears throat> I watched a movie yesterday actually, uh, which had a really really bad climax. It was uh, it was building up, and it was a pretty long movie, and uh, it was all about this. Uh, guy taking revenge over his uh, father who had passed uh, or who had been killed and he was supposed to kill the killer mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, it, it was the worst climax because it ended in uh, that killer uh, being wounded deadly wounded by something else <laughs> <laughs> and then when he was about to die uh, he ended up stabbing him uh, either way, it was like, yeah, I'm, 
I'm, I'm still stabbing you. I'm not letting go and I'm not uh, finding some kind of catharsis that either uh, way it was, uh, it was like, what is this kind of climax? It was, uh, yeah. That's like a terrible. typical Quentin Tarantino uh, type of anti-climax where yeah. you're about to have the most dramatic of fights and there's suddenly just a train runs over the, the villain. Uh, but which, which yeah. film was that? Uh, Gangs of New York. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had I never seen it before, but it, to me it was a typical example of uh, a lot of great actors and uh, a lot of uh, uh, special effects and drama and uh, yeah. everything but uh, and and a really good basis for a plot but not it was not well crafted yeah. or uh, played through i think yeah, yeah there, there's so many mistakes that can be made um i remember i saw um, tosca in in oslo uh, at opera and then you have that that scene where uh, she agrees because, of course, he forces her. She agrees to sleep with the police commissioner so that she and her lover can escape. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, there's a climax. She, he jumps on her and he, she, he gets the Baccio de Tosca, the knife uh, stab, right, instead of her sleeping with her. But in the in the um, uh, performance, he was already jumped her once, no, it didn't happen. T twice, no, it didn't happen. Then a third time, then suddenly she stabs him. And it just took away the whole huh. climax because yeah. it was repeated. Or it was, she did it two times before it yeah. actually happened. You know, it's, mm. um, it's a horrible thing. But, and and so, so that's one thing to, to understand what is the climax and what yeah. competes mm. with the climax. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's one aspect that I think is... Uh, is um, very useful with Ayn Rand's uh, aesthetic philosophy is that she's really uh, she's really paying respect to the craftsmanship and knowledge and difficulty of making uh, of making good uh, literature or painting or uh, uh, or other pieces of uh, of art and uh, she um, it, because you you mentioned that she she talks about uh, how this sense of life. Yep. Is, is supposed to be uh, to be shown through the through the work, and uh, and as I remember, she says it's a very complicated and and difficult process because most people just have a sense of life, yep. uh, and then a few people manage to take the philosophical step and actually. Uh, I mean, concretize, con uh, become yes. aware of it. Yes, yeah. become aware of it and concretize it. And then the next step is to manage to make it into a work, make it yes. into literature and, and, and to convey that sense of life again. Mm. And, yeah. um, and it's very um, uh, admirable that she manages even to uh, not only pay that respect or what you can call it acknowledge um, it. Uh, yeah. not only acknowledges but also uh, acknowledge it but also to explain it to go through a, yeah. almost like a recipe on, uh, yeah. on how mm. to do it oh yeah it's, and it's uh there's no doubt that uh the top writers uh in the literature history have been complete utter masters at what they were uh, doing i mean writing literature and writing plots is very very difficult because there's a, a gigantic context which you have to keep in mind mm. at all times mm. i think the best the best book i've uh, uh i've read or at least one of the best plots is the count of Monte cristo and uh, that is a massive book um it's 12 or 1300 pages i i think and uh, there's just so many characters and there's so many events going on and so much at the same time uh but absolutely everything uh has a place in the overall oh, story have you read it no what well, that's a sh on a short side note there i did read it and i was a bit disappointed and i, I talked to, to bork about it and then he says well it's yeah 1200 pages long and the one i read was like 300 so it's a short oh, yes. version it's like yeah. no wonder because sometimes right. this jumps sometimes this happens i didn't get it but there you go yeah Oh, it's uh, the, my girlfriend did the same mistake actually. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. But I was, we were. I but that's was interesting. Uh, just uh, to interject that uh, the, there's a, there's some connections between Ayn Rand and Aristotle. Yeah. Uh, which is the classical way of thinking. Also, that what you have there has to be there. Cannot be removed. You cannot add anything. And if if you start doing yes. that, you take away from exactly. the attention that got, or the focus of the story. Exactly. So of course, a shortened version of the Count of Monte Cristo it it's is disastrous. Is a slaughter. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, the, uh, it's. Uh, so I haven't really read it. I, no. Yeah. 
oh, 300 pages is, is <laughs> awful. <laughs> the, I, I was looking at the book that my girlfriend had uh, read, and I saw that it was, like, it was 800 pages long. So even that, I mean, a bit longer than 300, yeah, yeah, yeah. it still cuts out 500 pages of content. Wow. And 500 pages is like a long novel in and of itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you read the full, the full version, uh, it's just absolutely everything. And I mean, um, he, he interacts with so many characters. I think I counted once. There's like 45 different characters. And they all have wow. an integral part in the story. It's, it's absolutely... Um, it's just mind-boggling. Mm. I mean, you could. Uh, there's. I mean, there's not a criticism, but I think the the story is a revenge story. Yeah. So there's something a bit simplistic in that, but it's. So it's like a one a one liner too much. You mean or one liner? Like or like too too not one line but more too more monomanic about just that one. Yeah, perhaps. Theme. Uh, well, I think the theme is the theme is very very good. I mean, I think it's only like. Um, uh, I guess the theme of, say, the Fountainhead or Victor Hugo, one of Victor Hugo's novels would be considered to be better fundamentally because they were not uh, about vengeance, which is a very simple, I mean, uh, you did something bad to me, so I'll do something bad to you. Mm. It's a bit primitive. It's not mm. too philosophical. But in The Count of Monte Cristo, it's just completely uh, irrelevant. It's, it's just such an amazing journey. So many characters. Mm. And then all of this plays into like the same like sometimes you think well what is going on here like we're we're it seems like we're going off topic when reading uh. this because we're uh now suddenly we're all the way over here but you find out that it's actually connected to the main thing again it's yeah, yeah. it's um uh, and the climax of that is just the most intense reading experience i've ever had in uh, my life yeah truly uh, the magnificent book uh. how is that um because when, when you say theme uh, Ayn Rand operates with with the uh, doesn't she operate with two different concepts there the theme of the story and there's plot theme the plot yeah so, so how is that again so the plot theme is uh, <clears throat> is just more related to the actual plot the plot is just the situation summarized in one sentence mm. uh, and the the theme is more the overarching message that the author wants to convey mm. uh, with his uh, with his work right. right. Mm. So that obviously helps too that you have some idea of the general idea, direction yes. of what you're going to uh, to make. Yeah. So it's, uh, uh, I mean, it's uh, it's crucial for a writer to know both the plot theme and the theme of his own work. Mm. <laughs> I mean, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, well, it's something like the elevator pitch. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Sort of. Yeah. yeah. And then it's also uh, it's the uh, it's the role of the reader to identify what the author wants to mm. wants to write. Yeah. Mm. Right. There's there's one aspect with uh, with Rand's uh, aesthetic philosophy that uh, I'm I'm curious to to hear your view on uh, who have used it as uh, in your in your work because she talks about that she's very into the sense of life. Yes. Uh, and uh, as I read her it's um, uh, it's a Great critique on the nihilism uh, that you can see and the uh, modernistic art that is supposed to be you do not know what you're doing and it's supposed to be uh, just an, uh, just a vague expression of meaning or nonsense or something like that. But, but also that life is hopeless. Yes, and, and that life is hopeless. But then um, <clears throat> I'm curious what room she leaves for tragedy. Because that can be read as life is hopeless, but not in the modernistic way, but in a, uh, you can say, uh, ancient Greek way of you cannot fight destiny. Right. And uh, or that uh, there is something about the human condition that is you are um, that we are fighting against. It could be society, it could be nature uh, or it could be uh, one's own demons or something like that yeah. and she uh, to me she can seem some sometimes as putting uh, almost too much into uh, the fact that it should be this uh, strong hero that is uh, that has solutions and shows shows the best version of man and i i see that but does she um, does she keep the door uh, closed for really good 
uh, aspects of tragedy. For, for instance, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, I remember I saw this one art critic who criticized uh, uh, Odd Nerdrum's Iceland paintings when, when they were new in the 80s. And he said, it's, uh, uh, yes, they are well executed and everything, but the view of man that these paintings represent as being desolate and being there's no uh, hope and there's uh, just this desert landscape, civilization is gone. That is outrageous to present that kind of view on man because man is more vitalistic or uh, something like that. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious whether that could be uh, applied to aspects of Rand's philosophy. Yeah. Uh, she uh, uh, she definitely didn't uh, rule out. I mean, I think I thought this at some point, and I was under the conviction that tragedies uh, such are bad um, because it's a negative view of life. Yeah, because it's it's a negative, and you know, or, you're you're saying if you lose at the end of the movie, you're basically saying that man as such loses. But uh, I mean, that is that is obviously not the case. And um, Ayn Rand has even written a tragedy. Uh, her biggest novel after Atlas Shrugged and uh, The Fountainhead is a tragedy. Uh, and in that book, the, the spoiler alert, the, the main characters uh, die because of uh, the, di the dictatorship that they live in. So they, are, they live in the Soviet Union. And, um, we the Living, is it? Yes, We the oh, Living. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, but the uh, tragedies, uh, I guess in her view, and also my teacher, uh, my philosophy teacher t taught me this, that tragedies are a very good tool to uh, to demonstrate sort of um, uh, the outcome of, say, negative, uh, negative philosophies. So in the We the Living, it's used to demonstrate that uh, dictatorship and collectivism destroy the best within people. Mm. So what happens in the end is that the main character kind of triumphs spiritually. Like she feels she tries to escape from uh, from the Soviet Union, and uh, at uh, at the end, as she is uh, like basically dying, uh, she kind of feels liberated from uh, I guess from the prison that she was in. Not because she's about to die, because she believes that despite all this evil, there is still good. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I think a lot of the tragedies that do exist have very negative views of man. For instance, in uh, the Shakespeare uh, plays that I have uh, read. But generally, I, I would definitely not say anymore that uh, tragedies are uh, just as such uh, negates man in any way. Because uh, man can lose. And if man has uh, bad ideas, then he most certainly can lose. And if you use that as, uh, as your purpose whenever you're writing tragedy, I think that's perfectly legitimate. Well, you have that character of uh, Eddie Willers in After yes. Shrugged, yes. who sort of just crumbles at the end. Yeah, her uh, the the secretary of the of um, Dagny. Dagny, right? Yeah, yeah. So but that doesn't mean that Ayn Rand is saying that okay, then everything is hopeless and everyone will die if they no. have some adversary. Uh, no, uh, no, no, no. And plenty of the characters crumble in uh, crumble in her uh, in her novels, mm. but that is the. Um, that is the sort of uh, the literary romanticism in her uh, in her uh, in her view, because romanticism, as she defines it, is the art that um, it's based on the recognition of man's free will. Mm. So if you have volition and if you have the capacity to make choices, you also you have both the capacity to make good choices and win, but you also have the capacity to make the wrong choices and disregard the good choices and then at the end of the day, you lose, like mm -hmm. Peter Keating does in The Fountainhead. Because mm. he knows at several points uh, what he could do and what he perhaps should do, but he chooses away from that to uh, instead play on the like will or the uh, popularity that he gets from compromising on his true values. Yeah, and I mean, if you don't have those aspects, then you get 
uh, cardboard figures. I mean, this is what uh, people love to say about uh, about Ayn Rand. They have the, she has these cardboard figures. Yeah. And uh, I'm thinking, okay, first of all, if you read like a, if you imagine the cliche contemporary novel, yeah. it's a man who's completely hopeless who cannot cope with life and it just jerks off in bed or something like that. <laughs> I said, okay, well, that's very deep and very uh, uh, individual <laughs> description of psychology of man. It's like from a recipe about how man should be today. Yeah. Uh, which is a cardboard figure. Yeah. So it's it's sort of a uh, not a very serious counter argument because uh, as we've been talking about now, just when we start talking about the different figures, um, you see that there's Peter Keating, there's um, uh, Dagnes' brother in Atlas Shrugged, uh, Jim, Jim, Jim Taggart, yeah, yeah. who's a complete uh, asshole. Yes. And uh, and his wife, who suddenly discovers who he actually is. Yes. And it's just disillusioned by that and sort of, like, well, be, uh, commits suicide yeah. because of that. In practice, yes. Um, so there's all these these uh, different variations of choices people take and what they're faced with, how they deal with uh, exactly. disillusionment and so. And that's just a, you should just say, <laughs> almost like a neutral description of different characters. There are different uh, uh, characters among human beings. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, if you don't have that, I mean, it's, it's the same thing as in, for example, uh, um, the teacher of uh, Raphael Perugino. Yeah. He was criticized of making the same face as all, all the figures. And immediately I, I was thinking, oh, is, this, is he being accused of being unoriginal? And I thought, oh, of course not. He's being accused of just having cardboard figures. Yeah. That is the same model for each of them. And then it becomes, um, yeah, you don't see the individuality of the actual figures and it becomes less credible. Yeah. And the critics... Yeah. The critics who say these things usually prefer the kind of uh, characters in novels where people are just, you know, jerking off at random or yeah. just doing yeah. something. Uh, um, I mean, one of the Norwegian, uh, one of the Norwegian uh, authors, which I absolutely cannot read, um, Alan Lou, mm. uh, he writes, you know, about a guy who just has a, uh, I don't know, psychological breakdown, just like moves out in the forest. And then there's no there's no plot, there's no continuous action. There's just like, oh, and then suddenly he does this, and then suddenly he does that, and then now he's thinking about some sort of uh, children's TV program and stuff. So mm. uh, I think what people, what these critics react to is the fact that uh, these characters are integrated and purposeful, and that they have they actually have morals, and they. So for instance, Howard, like people would criticize Howard York for just being like a, a boring character. Uh, but I think to them the reason why he's boring is because he ac he's actually purposeful and conscious in mm. his in his actions. Yeah, Whereas yeah. they would prefer just someone who has no idea what they're doing, and they're suddenly at this moment they're doing this, and now they're just oh, I wouldn't kill someone, so they suddenly kill someone, and it's just like the complete uh, disintegration of a, a human being is what they find interesting. Yeah, I mean that is, that's what comes in. I mean I remember read, uh, learning about that in in school about uh, Knut Thompson. And uh, what's the term, the, the, the irrationalities of the soul, something like that, uh, which becomes uh, sort of his um, guidance. I mean, he's a wonderful author, but, but uh, introducing that idea, that just description of what goes, goes on in the mind is sort of more deep, more psychological, and yeah. outer action becomes sort of superficial. Yeah. That's the gist of it, right? Exactly. Uh, and and uh, I mean, that is... Uh, that is just strange and it's wrong because it's, yeah. it's what you choose at the end of the day because everyone can be filled with uh, yeah. weird thoughts and yeah. but the choice to act or not act upon them is what makes, is what makes it actually important. And that's, that's the role it uh, should have and deserves yeah. in art. In and that's way. why she's also very concerned with uh, criticizing uh, naturalism. Yes, because naturalism it, just, uh, I mean, does the opposite of uh, this. It disregards choice as such. She talks about, uh, what's the word, um, determinism, determinism. Isn't it? in, in yes. co that context, right? Yes. So they are just determined by typically poverty and that's why he's drinking and she has to become a prostitute and it's exactly. just, everything is just raining all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's, like, it's, it's the same in, in, in painting, you know, in the, um, what, what is it, like uh, 1880s with um, uh, Bastien Lepage? It's a, it's a good painter, but the gray weather comes in. Yeah. There's no dramatic lighting anymore. There's no, no Caravaggio drama. It's just everything is, is every day. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So there's just, uh, 
yeah, I mean, uh, it's uh, they are they're taking the statistical uh, approach. <laughs> right. She talks yeah. about the statistics. What does she say about that? She says that a, a whereas a romanticist would um, disregard things he thought as unessential. Yeah. Uh, focus on the important things, so saying a man fighting for his integrity, a man uh, like fighting for his moral values or something. A naturalist will just say, you know his frame of uh, reference will just be to observe people in the streets yeah. and uh, uh, his protagonist will be the, just the statistical average human <laughs> being <laughs> because it's just we're not focusing on anything um, uh, on anything important you're just trying to communicate uh, life as it is mm. at this moment so when you're when your standard of art is or when you're uh, when your sense of life is that there's nothing necessarily that matters as much or you don't have these heightened values it's just you know this is what life is at the moment then you'll yeah. just then if you want to express that well what are you going to express well you're just going to find some people and just show their life yeah uh, it's kind of like what we were talking about just before you started about the uh, stalin's death when they have to re-record -re yes the concert and just crams people into the concert hall because they have to have the right uh, acoustics <laughs> yes. like no matter who goes just get people in <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay sorry Carl. No, i was just saying that uh, there's uh, there's one place where she says in in one lecture i i think where she says uh, talking about the naturalists that uh, that because they're uh, because they observe more ugliness than beauty yeah. they don't believe beauty exists yeah. And because they observe more poverty than uh, than wealth, yeah. uh, then wealth and richness doesn't exist, mm -hmm. and and that's the the approach to to so-called natural reality. Right, and I think that's that's so strange. I mean, you get that cliche. I guess it comes from several directions or or several sources. But I mean, I mean, this whole. At least the cliche of, of uh, Sigmund Freud, where if you look deep enough, you find that you have a gutter inside of your soul. Like if you really go down to what is true, that's what you find. Okay. Um, or, that, or at least that modern cliche of yeah. psychology. Yeah, 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 you, yeah. Really deep inside, if you feel, then you're alone and just wretched and, and everything is horrible. Um, and they, this is presented just like in general as a more true version of man because happiness and all these things are just superficial yeah and i'm thinking okay uh, oh, happiness and being in love and being aroused sexually or all kinds of these, th these things they've never experienced that that's not mm. a part of life right i mean that, that that that's a cliche yeah that it should be exactly just that more emotional just that state yeah and I, i've been thinking about it because first uh, we, we've talked a bit about the romantic manifest a couple of times on the show here um, and, and the first reading about it, I, I was a bit skeptical about how the same point that you, been, you uh, mentioned just uh, some minutes ago, of how it can seem like she just wants these sort of uh, untouchable heroes that have no flaws and everything yes. should be perfect. And it can, if you want to make fun of it, it can, it can sound like she's, uh, uh, she's, she's going for some kind of a communist uh, perfect man, yeah. you know, the new farmer, the new worker or <laughs> something like that, right? But uh, obviously it's much more nuanced than that. And, and actually, when you, if you look at it, it's actually the opposite that she, is working for, or, or um, advocating for a more nuanced description of man yep. other than the naturalist where it's just everything is just dark everything is just hopeless everything is determined yeah and um, uh, I think one interesting thing as well is that um, Howard Rourke is described as being physically ugly in the fountainhead Oh, you see. Yeah, because he has like yeah. long orange hair and his very bony face. Huh? Um, uh, so it's like people would think. I think the stereotype that people would draw is like, oh, she only, she would have like the Greek approach, only yeah. like muscular. They're men. walking like this all yes. the time. <laughs> but in truth, yeah. um, Howard Rourke is uh, is uh, is physically, uh, I think, very ugly described as very ugly in the fountainhead it's the same or not the exact same but it's a similar thing she does in the atlas shrugged because uh, john galt 
who is like the hero. Yeah. Uh, he is described as being born like just in some gas station, like like even lower than so-called white trash. Yeah. And he doesn't know who his father is. Everything's just you know you would have a, have material there for a naturalistic novel. Yeah. Um, but he fights himself up and it becomes a character, becomes an int integra integrated human being. Exactly. And uh, yeah, there I think go. that's that's the that's the crucial. I mean, that's where the uh, romantics and the naturalists reveal themselves is their their estimation of. Uh, potential of the yeah, human, the, yeah. the potential of the human, like because yeah. most people, most naturalists writing about the slums would just say, "Well, these people are born into poverty, and you know, here they are, <laughs> and, like, uh, stay there, <laughs> <laughs> and here you're going to be for the rest of your life." Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, but even though they they know that people can get out of it, mm. uh, they they choose to ignore that, and I think the uh, the the sense of life that would be more. Uh, I mean, you you mentioned this in your in the episode with uh, Vega, uh, the um, how she turned around the where naturalists criticized her for being escapist, yeah, and then she says that well, no, you're just making like excuses for maintaining uh, poor or like wretched or something like that because you're just all you're painting or all you're writing about are the people who are miserable and failed and stuff. Yeah, uh, but what I'm doing is showing the potential of change that you can actually reach these new yeah. levels. Yeah. So I'm challenging uh, people to actually become better versions of themselves. So, yeah. Just to dig a bit more into that, and I'm, uh, I'm not doing this as a criticism of Rand of the cardboard uh, figures. I'm, I'm just curious on exactly where she's going with the philosophy. With, I, I, I do see the point that uh, uh, the criticism of the naturalist that it's uh, you're born there it's poor and there's no hope yeah i, I see the critique of that and i think it's a very good critique mm. but then uh does she open for that uh that kind of tragedy that is not in the we the living where the character i, I haven't read it myself uh, yeah. i must say but as you explained that uh there is a tragic action but the character get some sign kind of sense that I'm I'm still the winner but although it's uh, it's not going well it's not yeah. a happy ending but does she open for this other way of uh, having or this other way of presenting a sense of life which is the real like the real tragedy like uh, like uh, Eugene Onegin where it's just tragedy they uh, mm. they're not bad people they make bad choices but it's uh, but they do not get any sense that i did after all i did my best and uh, i i can uh, die with uh, honor or something it's just misery and lady deadlock in uh, in oh. the bleak house by dickens it's it's just they're just two kind people but they don't communicate and it's tragedy but so the for the characters there's no uh no salvation at all they go all the way down but we as the viewer we get i would say i would say a positive sense of life because we learn from their tragedy mm. so yeah. in I, I if if we as we should do with all philosophers try to read them in a favorable light mm -hmm. that's a favorable way i will interpret ayn rand to say that well that does portray a sense of life although it's really it's really tragedy and they're not uh they can be uh, good human beings they can be heroes but they they are uh they are uh, really in the, you mean in the, in the story itself there's no hope Yes, but you can learn something from that story so that you do not make the same mistake. For example, or you yes, are aware something. of the phenomenon at least. Yeah. Uh, but if you get the, if you're left with with the feeling that this uh, could have been different, I mean, uh, if the author somehow implies that um, that um, that it doesn't have to be like this, that that because I have not I haven't read the specific but just trying to understand what you what you said if the author is 
making some sort of tragedy where the audience is left with the feeling of, well, this is what I uh, should avoid doing, then, I, then uh, that is most certainly a valid, uh, valid form of tragedy. But <clears throat> I would say most tragedies or many of the bigger tragedies from from uh, from Shakespeare, they often communicate that I mean the naturalistic tragedies that whatever you do, it it won't help. So if you read a tragedy like like that one, you were you would be left with the feeling that whatever I do, it will end in tragedy. But if you watch a tragedy and you think, okay, this is what I should avoid mm. to uh, to avoid this situation, then then yes, I think I think that falls under her uh, under her view of uh, of sense of life and art and tragedy. Yeah, mm. yeah I remember reading that. But that was some years ago. But so the freshest thing in my mind, uh, I don't remember how closely it follows the actual poem. It's actually a poem. Yeah. Um, is that the uh, filmization of it uh, from uh, with uh, Liv Tyler and mm-hmm. um, the other guy, um, and then <laughs> she is in love with him, and he's sort of a high society, sort of a dandy guy. So he doesn't really understand that, right. and when he understands, it's it's too late. And then the, the ending scene there, where he says to the servant, "There's a letter from me," he, because he's he's think he's hoping there's a letter from her, and yeah. the, the servant says, "No, there's a letter from me." And then at the end scene, he just walks alone up the street and you understand that he has lost everything. And that's the rest of his life to just walk alone. Okay. And then you just say, okay, this, I do not want to experience that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you have to be careful about what, uh, how, how you treat people. And uh, yeah. I think that's, uh, that, that's the thing that you can, it doesn't have to be explained in the actual story, but of you course. can get that sense and then, okay, wow, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's difficult to differentiate between uh, what uh, spectators can get from a certain artwork and what uh, and what the author actually has uh, uh, portrayed. Because the function of art is to the sort of psychoepistemological function of art is to bring your sense of life, your deeper fundamental metaphysical convictions, to your conscious mind, so you can actually contemplate what your view of life is. And if you, I think, if you if you have a good sense of life and you watch something that that uh, that is a bad sense of life. Uh, uh, then you then you could probably be left with some sort of feeling like this that uh, uh, that oh I, I don't I don't want to end up like this. But if I think even uh, yeah, I mean this is just a thought that I have that if uh, if a tragedy leaves you with that feeling that oh this is what I have to avoid, then the author must at some point have uh, made it clear that the choice of the characters led to these uh, yeah, to yeah, these yeah. Uh, so then mm. then we sort of are talking about volition right and uh, so that's the key term here not that something ends badly or no. not but the actual volition and and the consequence yes, of an action I think so I so think. it's not just uh, arbitrarily happening to you and you have no control over it at all exactly yeah, yeah. so you can you don't have to have the heroic uh, son of the Soviet Union <laughs> to, no. to, to get something <laughs> positive out of it right yeah not because yeah. that's typically the cliche sort of quote unquote criticism of Ayn Rand is that she has these cardboard figures but I mean it's I think that's clarifying it uh, quite uh, yeah clear yeah making I, th- it quite clear. I think the the fundamental I mean the because the, tragedy well, then we're talking about literature the stories and stuff uh, that as long as uh, as long as the fundamental premise is is choice and that if the fundamental premise is choice then you leave open the fact of both alternatives good ending and bad ending mm. and then it, you can end it either way i think mm. yeah yeah exactly and then you're also talking about <clears throat> that the different characters have to communicate in a credible way to each other so that one what one does has some kind there's a causal relationship yes there yes and i think that that so so that that's amazing. speaking of what you started with uh, when you are making a plot, if it's a painting or if it's a novel, you can choose between ca- causality and casuality. It's, yes. uh, casuality is the modern idea, causality is the classic exactly. idea. She, she, uh, she uses the, the metaphor that uh, in the romantic uh, work of literature, the protagonist or the hero is someone who is uh, uh, going towards something is being motivated by some sort of end goal but in naturalism it's just someone being pushed from behind mm. uh, so that in a 
in a romantic work, yeah. in a novel, that you're actually pursuing mm. something. There's a character who wants something, who values something, um, and then he encounters challenges on that way, and then he overcomes the challenges and then wins. But in naturalism, there's no necessarily no, there's not necessarily a purpose that the character has. He's just, I mean, he's just living life. I mean, waking up and mm. eating food and going to work and then stuff like that, and then some event will just push him behind, which will lead him to just something. It's the difference between um, uh, chasing a, uh, a bird and being chased by a bear, I think. Because mm. <laughs> be uh, when, yeah. when you're chasing a bird, you're kind of acting yeah. towards some goal. And if you're chasing by a bear, you're just running where, just wherever it's, like, wherever you have to run. I think that's yeah. the it's a good comparison between naturalism and romanticism. Unless you integrate it and uh, you make uh, this conflict between the bear and the man something uh, that sparks... Yeah, <laughs> sparks him and shows his character. Somehow, exactly. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you're talking about the difference between just being pushed here and there, yes. or, or acting, choosing to act in a certain yeah. way. I don't have the I don't have the best of uh, uh, examples to use for the naturalistic uh, literature. Uh, Balzac. Huh? Uh, uh, Balzac. I've I haven't read French, French writer. I, uh, I I think she mentioned him as a as an example. Okay, of uh, uh, naturalism. Yeah. Okay. He's very much into uh, uh, into describing society and man's place in society, and uh, and um, and how you can try in in his main main work, Lost Illusions. It's about this aspiring poet from uh, a lower class trying to make it in uh, in the society, and he almost man manages, but then it's like no. You have no chance yeah. in in society, and he had to go back to his village. Right. Yeah, and that would be a good example of naturalistic uh, naturalistic design. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I always think of um, I don't know if you know the painter Lucian Freud. I have uh, seen something. I think. Yeah, I think that's where you have a very good uh, description. Not necessarily of naturalism as such, but of course it it has that has that uh, in terms of how he paints it's all flat flat uh, flat lighting so there's no focus uh, in it and uh, and um, but i think the main problem there is that there is no volition at all yeah they're just depressed and you get that's the sense of life you get from it yeah depressionism uh, what depressionism? Depressionism. That's depressionism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's uh, so when you talk about um, yeah, that, that's what yeah I was thinking about that. Could you remind me of that term? <laughs> I mean, after impressionism, there's just been depressionism. You know, yeah, that's basically what it is. Yeah, but but you can have. <clears throat> you can have many uh, different versions of it. So you can have some kind of a drama, not necessarily on a grand scale with a lot of uh, gesticulations in the painting, but sort of calmer. Mm. And I think about Andrew Wyeth, for example. Do you know him? Who? Andrew Wyeth. He painted Christina's World. This is his most famous uh, ah, painting, yes, but yes. he's done other things. He's like, okay, so this could be an example, but if you don't know it, well, we can try it out to see, see what you think of it. Um, do you know that painting that's called a tenant farmer? There's a house. There's no people. There's there's this house. Like a, you can sort of imagine that it's 1950s or so or 40s, but it's not specifically 1940s naturalism at all. Yeah. And then in the tree there, the, there hangs a dead deer. And that has always always struck me as something really uh, powerful because, it's, it, as I understand it, he doesn't say that okay, you'll just die anyways, but there is some there is the tragedy of the deer there, and you, that you somehow can relate to without necessarily thinking, oh, I have to end up dead hanging in a tree. Okay, and it's kind of a weird. Uh, um, is, there's not no clear action. Right. So immediately you could understand it as something that is sort of depressionism, but I don't understand it in that way at all because okay. there is a there is a conscious choice. So there's sort of volition on the part, at least, of Andrew Wyeth, of what he focuses on and how he how he uh, crafts the whole image. So it's not. Uh, so maybe it's that it's the love for the execution that makes it so poetic and not just depressed. Oh, here's a dead deer. Like uh, we'll all end up like dead deers, you know. Um, I think that th there's something to that as okay. well. 
How how would you get the impression that we'll we'll all end up dead from a dead? No, uh, you, you could immediately think that okay, uh, here's the sen- here the sense of life is oh, that okay. uh, you're hanging. It's just a dead deer hanging from a tree. Right. So you could understand that as a very sort of naturalist sense of life. Okay, I in see. That sense, but uh, it just struck me when it, when when I'm thinking about it now as I'm speaking that the the love for it in the how he crafts it is a, at least a major part from uh, in saving it from just being depression depressionistic okay yeah. i see uh, yeah, i just thought about it because it's sort of a it's not a clear cut case it can be a sort of um uh it's not clear cut romantic in that sense so no. it could be understood as, stood as being i see quite sort of so-called modern <laughs> but uh, andrew wyth is a naturalist painter isn't he or is he uh Yes and no. I mean that that's the weird thing about him that he can be very sort of exact and it's that person he, he well when you read the books he's always talking about that model and he painted it that time and with that experience but of course you can just take away all those stories those are unnecessary. Okay. Um and and I think it's the, his love for it the poetry and his love for what he sees that mm. makes him even when he paints just just a calf standing there by by this uh wall. Yeah. He makes it into something grand or something wonderful and something beautiful. Okay. Would you say the same about uh, Christina's world? Uh, Does he painted that one as well? Yeah, yeah. I would say so. I don't think it's his best painting, but that, that, that's where you could say, okay, she's crippled. But well, then again, it's like, okay, we know the biography, so maybe that influences the understanding of it. So maybe I'm, maybe I'm. Because uh, I looked at I looked at Christina's world without knowing the context. Yeah. And I didn't I didn't pick up uh, as much. I mean, it was a it's kind of bleak the painting, isn't it? I mean, the sky is very gray. And yeah, yeah, it works with quite grayish brownish yeah. colors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, but not knowing the context, I wasn't immediately struck by that this is some sort of negative uh, meaning or something. Right, like that. right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, I mean, that's kind of uh, 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 that could that you could say that that would be an example of contemplating the artwork in itself, like uh, uh, regardless of who painted it or something you know, like a, just just the artwork in itself. Yeah, and that's how it should be. I mean, yes. you shouldn't. Ha- you you could look at sick child by monk without knowing that it's a sister, and that, so these things can influence you to like things yeah. better because you have sympathy with the situation that led to the painting being made. Exactly, or, uh, yeah. and that's the that's the thing about uh, modern art. It's uh, it's completely dependent on backstory for any yeah. sort of. Uh, yeah. When I held my um, my my lecture about art, which that, is partly why we um, yes. invited you to come. Yeah. When I held that lecture, there was a, uh, a I think she was a painter. She was a modernist in the audience, and then I had uh, used a uh, Pollock painting as an example of uh, bad art, mm. and then, uh, which is, I mean, it's just a mess. I mean, he throws just paint at, at a canvas, and um, you're not talking about skill or craft. No, you're not talking about skill or craft, and then, uh, I mean, just looking at it, it doesn't convey anything, mm. like anything at all. It's just blobs and dots and dashes on a canvas. That's all that it is, and then um, and then uh, she uh, she raised her hand and she's like like uh, I don't agree with that at all because Pollock he was um, uh, studying I think Native Americans and their suffering and their struggles or something, mm. and uh, in this painting uh, he like uh, he put the like the screams that he heard of their suffering, mm. um, and I was like what, you see that in there? And she's like, yes, I can see the screams and I can see the suffering of because these Because you natives. know. Exactly, because you know. But if you just look at the painting, mm. the, it doesn't tell you anything. Right. But, but uh, you definitely could paint something that immediately lets you know that here's someone suffering. Uh, but that, that was just complete. So, so, uh, so modern art, uh, for any interpretation, is completely dependent on the backstory of the of the of the painter and the story because there is yeah. nothing objective dependent on your answer. your sympathy for yes. whatever political cause is um, presented yes. yeah. and because then you and then you can claim to see some sort of meaning in mm. people squirting paint out of their anus on a, onto the floor but i mean that there's nothing objectively uh, nothing objective sense of life in that mm. That is, speaking of something objective about what is quality or not, it's one thing I thought of, and I don't, I'm not sure if Ayn Rand talks specifically about that, but 
this is something I learned from at least from books on screenwriting that I've I've read. This thing about uh, showing, not telling, yes. and I got it so well illustrated. I, you know, you know these um, uh, these Studio Ghibli movies that are so strange with all these weird <laughs> spirits and shapes. Uh, you wouldn't think that could work as actually how the figures are drawn. It's like, uh, it shouldn't work. Anyway, they get it to work and all these fantastic things that happen, they make it credible. Um, and so, of course, there are other uh, sort of, is it manga it's called? No, it's uh, this uh, type of... of uh, Japanese? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the anime? Anime, yeah. 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 So the, the, there are others trying to make same, same type of stories. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what that is called, but there was another one where... Uh, something was very important and then time stopped and there was this god appearing and, and uh, in the form of a bull or something and that was fine but then this little spirit that was helping her was all the time incessantly explaining that this god means this <laughs> and that's why you have to do this because if not that happens it's and I was, it just made me insane watching it because I, I didn't get to see the movie because she, right. that, that spirit was explaining all the time what, what the movie was about. <laughs> I mean, she, she could almost start saying that, uh, oh, and, and by the way, the guy who's drawing me right now is called, you know, is, I mean, it was it, it, totally idiotic. I mean, yeah. to be able to, to understand what competes with the story and what helps the story. Yes. And that is the, I mean, uh, Ayn Rand says this, that the uh, art is not didactic. It shouldn't, yeah, yeah. it shouldn't be teaching you. It shouldn't be uh, lecturing you like, this is good, this is bad, something like mm. that. Because the purpose is to, the purpose is to illustrate a sense of life. Yeah. And it is actually to make concrete that which is abstract. And the best way to do this is to actually make something concrete. Mm. So if you... Uh, like I can hold a lecture on objectivism and uh, and people can be sitting there like, okay I, I understand what this is about and uh, they can have uh, people can have emotional reactions to hearing ideas uh, like re reading philosophy like oh yeah this doesn't make sense and this feels very true and stuff but uh, uh, reading the fountainhead or reading a piece of art is so much more emotional than uh, than reading or listening to philosophy because then you're actually given sort of existence in a in a sum like materialized in your hand you can actually see existence in a movie or in a book or in a song or something like that um, and then uh, from that book you can see okay yes this is how life is this is how life is to me or something like that so that's the this is the show not tell principle because it's yeah. it's much more effective in actually communicating a sense of life, in communicating a philosophy. I mean, that's I mean, you talk yeah, about this. That's why the Bible is so, or the, the religions use art or uh, stories. Use metaphors. Use uh, use uh, basically exaggerated images. Yes. So that it will really hit you. Yes. So instead of explaining in scientific language what good ethics are, you just show someone being mistreated or treated exactly. in a bad way, and you think that's not correct because yeah. people because you won't react that way if someone just tells you about some sort of injustice. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that you have to see it in order to actually to feel yeah, it because yeah, yeah. it, it makes it it makes it real. Yeah, mm. yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, I was thinking about something. But it kind of slipped my mind right now. Do you have something to add? Yeah, I was just uh, since we talked about uh, some of the example that she, uh, some of the examples she used on naturalism. I, to me, it it has been a, um, it has been a nuancing aspect to know what kind of authors she really values because it 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 can be. Uh, read her philosophy can uh, her aesthetic philosophy can be read as being like you're supposed to portray a sense of life and this is the sense of life you should portray yeah but um, but she is very uh, uh, she admires uh, Dostoevsky Victor Hugo and they do not portray the same sense of life as her but she has uh, as I understand it she uh, admires the bottom line of the sense of life that mm -hmm. there are they're not naturalistic uh, authors they are more uh, that the um, uh, characters are actually acting on behalf of themselves and are uh, are 
um, beings that, yeah, that you can sympathize. The sentient beings yes, with volition. Yeah. 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 So, do you know any other uh, authors that she uh, that she admires? And uh, oh, sure. I think yeah, uh, Alexander Dumas, uh, who mm -hmm. uh, made uh, the Count of Monte Cristo, is uh, the first one that comes to mind. Um, she was a fan of Edmund Rostand, who wrote Cyrano de Bergerac. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she. Uh, in more modern literature, she liked uh, Mickey Spillane and um, the guy who wrote uh, James Bond, uh, Ian Fleming. Uh, not as uh, the greatest of writers, but as more like uh, simple uh, like mm. thrillers and stuff. But uh, from the big literature, it is, uh, you know, the uh, Dostoevsky and Victor Hugo and Alexander Dumas. And then uh, in, uh, in theater, these... Uh, these other ones that I mentioned, and uh, uh, I know she was a fan of Fritz Lang, the film director, um, also as portraying, um, well that might be more as a, I'm not sure if that was more of a writer or a director that she was a fan of him, but um, these are these are the first one that comes to mind, at least, uh, which she mentions in the Romantic Manifesto and, and like that, yeah. Mm. Uh, it might be worth just giving the definition of art since we're discussing uh, her uh, book i mean she she says that um that art is a selective recreation of reality according to a artist's metaphysical value judgment so just to give like a uh, whole picture of it that she says that um what art actually is and what uh this whole activity is is to uh, portray and express your sense of life and your uh philosophy and that um, it is a it is not just a, uh, a entertainment or it's just not just a uh, a method of having fun like on the side but it is a profound human need uh, for art she says that philosophy and art uh, cannot sustain man's life uh, like man needs both both philosophy and art and that art is for uh, not just some people, but for everyone, just as philosophy is. Because in, uh, because she says that philosophy is for everyone, and everyone needs philosophy. But in philosophy, you're dealing with uh, complex, abstract principles, and it's, uh, it's a huge sum of uh, knowledge and thinking that you have to do. And at the end of the day, you, you cannot uh, truly maintain a whole philosophy like uh, uh, as a single unit. It's like... You have all of these principles, even though they are integrated, but it's such a vast sum of theory that you need. You cannot art. see it all at once. You cannot see it all at once uh, as philosophy, but that's where art comes in, because art can actually give you philosophy as a as a single unit, because uh, it, it takes it takes this whole sum and then makes it into something concrete in order for like you an, to then contemplate. Like an icon to, to follow. That's yes. the right direction I'm going yes. in. Yeah. Like an ideal to, yeah. uh, to strive towards, uh, or like a vision of what existence uh, could be. I mean, she paraphrases uh, or, um, uh, Aristotle and says that art is uh, more important than history because art uh, shows you what yeah. can be or ought to be. Yeah. But I'm. Uh, I uh, I listened to this uh, uh, lecture by by Rand before uh, this talk, and and there she she says exactly that. But she says uh, that Aristotle says that uh, that uh, tragedy or poetry is uh, life as it uh, can be, and she says and ought to be and ought to be yes and. I'm, uh, I was wondering if that is a slight uh, misinterpretation of Aristotle or that she reads in her own philosophy into that because she's, she has, says and ought to be, not mm. can or ought to be, but that it should be uh, yes. uh, referencing to the conversation that we have had about tragedy that... Yeah. Uh, because that has been my concern with uh, with Rand's philosophy. Whether is, yeah. does she put too much emphasis on the art aspect and not just as one of two possible? Uh, well, I think ways. Tra tragedies are still uh, still fall under art uh, uh, because you're still dealing with uh, the consequence of choice. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, so they have volition, you see it goes wrong, and yes. you understand thereby it ought not be like this. Uh, yeah. Mm. Even though it happens in the story and yes. it's finished. For instance. Uh. Um, but I, I actually, I think I learned this yesterday that um, Aristotle, that this isn't a direct quote from Aristotle, as I understood it. She, uh, he didn't actually say those words in particular, but the, it was more her sort of uh, summation of what of right. his uh, of his philosophy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So whether uh, uh, I'm not completely sure if the standard is in objectivist literature is uh, and or or <laughs> in that, yeah. but but it is interesting because. Yeah. Um, uh, it would be weird if it was just an an or and not the and because mm-hmm. if you if you <laughs> yes. if the purpose of art is just to to express yeah. how life can be then you know then you're open to all sorts of things and then you can just make make stories about uh, you know people doing all sorts of weird uh, things if it's just how life can be mm-hmm. or ought to be that really opens up the whole field for anything. But there, there's a related aspect in that when she says. It's uh, um, how's the word the concretization of your metaphysical value judgments, yeah. your uh, sense of life, or, or the uh, the artist's sense of life, uh, the artist's metaphysical value judgments, as she says. And there, you could also uh, be critical about the formulation because uh, it's it cannot be your sense of life. It has to be something that is more general. So maybe that's just a slightly unlucky formulation because, as you just mentioned, it talks about uh, doesn't it use the word universal? It has to be universal, and as opposed to naturalistic. So I mean, yeah. so it's not like it's my view of life. You can ha- you can subscribe to a view of life which is m- broader and more general. Well, I mean, so I mean, but she's not saying that it's subjectivistic. It's just this is my view, this is your view, and we are all different views. I mean, it's just, it's just not subject subjectivistic in that sense. Well, I think I think it's still. Uh, well, if you if you work with archetypes yeah. or or something that you see across time, like you you you, um, you have in I mean, Atlas Shrugged is is a sort of an epic battle between good and evil. Yeah. So there is there, there's it's like a mythic story. It's absolutely not naturalistic. Right. So in that sense, it's not her personal view of life, but she adheres to a specific metaphysical, a specific sense of life that, of course, is shared by very many other people. Yes, but I think when you when we're when you're talking about when she talks about uh, your own sense of life, that it's not just a it's not just a philosophy or it's not just a generalized. Uh, view of good or evil it's it's way deeper than that it's um i mean she describes sense of life as like a preconceptual stage right. where you uh yeah. where you encounter the world uh like as a child and you encounter problems and then the sense of life kind of develops how how you view existence mm. so i don't think there's anything uh, wrong with saying that it's my view of uh of life because it is in the end, how I view life to be like, is life good, is life bad, or something like that. I mean, lots of other people can can have the same, can have the same uh, view, but I, I also think that there's a uh, uniqueness that everyone has and sort of shares and that uh, they have their own sense of life, even though it can be very similar to other people's sense of life and to other people's views of existence. But it's still it's still the view you have on existence, mm-hmm. and that is what you're uh, at the end of the day when you're making art. You're making uh, you're making something that you view to be important. So uh, I, I, I do think it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, legitimate to use uh, my own view in that in that context. I think so. So uh, <clears throat> Ayn Rand is a subjectivist. <laughs> <laughs> No, I uh, I definitely get uh, yep. get your point that uh, the the individuality is something that it's per- it's personal. everyone shares. Yes, it's, art is very personal. Wouldn't say wouldn't say it's subjective, but it's it's very personal because you put you literally put your soul into uh, something you make, and then yeah. But then it, the, my point is that that if it's only if it only pertains to your, your life, I mean, you have to generalize it so that other people can understand it from a different culture, from a different uh, period, whatever. Yeah, you make, uh, need to make it objective. Right. Yeah. So, ha. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> now, well, 
yeah, I mean, but you, yeah, you have to make it uh, objective, but it is still, um, it is still how you, how you, I mean, it's not, it's not uh, your own reality uh, that you're, you're, you're making. I mean, you're not creating your own rules. You're just saying that this is how I view the, ver the world that I live in. Mm. Yeah.